I'm Rob Port from SayAnythingBlog.com, North Dakota's most popular political blog. I'm here with Kevin Kramer, Public Service Commissioner, running for the U.S. House as a Republican this cycle. Kevin, thanks for your time. Thanks, Rob, for the opportunity. Always a pleasure. Definitely. Uh, I wanted to talk with you a, a little bit about your campaign uh, for the U.S. House. I've interviewed a lot of the other uh, House candidates who, of course, are going to the convention this weekend uh, to seek the nomination. Uh, but you're a candidate who decided not to seek the, the nomination at the convention, instead go to the primary ballot. And I know you've been asked about it endlessly before. <laughs> um, it's, it's been the topic of a lot of debate in the state, but I, I guess sure. I was just wondering, you know, what, you know, what, what caused that decision? I mean, what made you think that that was the better way to go? Well, first of all, Rob, for a long time, I've, I've liked the idea of, of an open primary. I tend to like elections. And, um, when I was, even when I was chairman over 20 years ago, I had forwarded the idea to our state uh, executive committee as a, as a possible way to choose our nominees. Now, um, it didn't go very far back then, but now I've been in a position, or I'm in a position where I can actually, uh, exercise that option. It's an option, of course, that is in law. In fact, you know, every candidate that's on the general election ballot, uh, that carries a party label has to win a primary. Uh, I'm just the first candidate in the Republican side anyway that's come along that's said that they would, that will actually bypass the convention, uh, and go straight to the primary. Others have lost the convention process and gone to the primary, but I'm the first one that announced it in advance. The reason I like it, Rob, is I think it's better for our party. And, and especially at a time like this when North Dakota is growing, we're going to have, you know, 30, 40,000 new voters perhaps by the time uh, this election rolls around. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to expand the involvement and the activism of um, of Republicans or all who would call themselves Republicans in North Dakota through this election process. Now, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not uh, so dishonest as to somehow suggest that there's not something in it for me. I think as a candidate, and I'm in this to win, I don't know why else you'd run for office, um, that, that there are some advantages I have in this process. I happen to believe of the six Republicans running for the nomination, I'm the most electable. I think that the best way to prove electability is at an election itself. And so while I think it helps the party grow, it, it's, it's a more inclusive process, um, I think it is a more liberty-oriented process to have an election for the nominee. Um, it's also one that strategically, uh, I think, gives me an edge over the other uh, the other candidates in the race so uh you know it's just it's just an honest attempt to 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 do it the right way quite frankly rob and i'd also say that you know it's a crowded field with six candidates seeking the nomination it creates an even more volatile situation at a small convention uh where you know hundreds or maybe a thousand or so uh, 1500 or so delegates make that decision you're no doubt going to have multiple ballots you start the horse trading and pretty soon the the um sort of the, the criteria in which somebody casts a vote becomes something other than who's the best person for the job who's the best candidate we can put forward in the general election against the democrat and pretty soon it starts becoming about um you know some horse trading and and uh and I just I like the I like the process of an election better. When you say that strategically going to a primary is better for you, what do you mean by that? I mean that I think I'm if if I was to weigh the two the two options and and by the way they're not options. You have to win a primary even if you get a, uh, an endorsement at the convention. But for me personally, I think that it's it, I'm more likely to win a primary uh, than I am to say finish first in a convention situation first of all because of as i explained you know six people on the ballot uh, you know a few hundred delegates a lot of volatility and horse trading that goes on but let's you know let's not be uh ignorant here either i you know i've done this before and and failed you know just the last uh convention i went to uh seeking the same endorsement and and didn't get first place didn't win and uh, i think this is a uh, for me this is a better way to go but i also think it can be a very uniting um a, a very uniting process for our entire party throughout the state. Now, w uh, you've been joined in this decision by Senate candidate Dwayne Sand, but his timing was a little bit different, whereas you announced your intention to do this uh, before the delegate selection process began. Uh, Mr. Sand announced it this week, uh, almost immediately before the convention. What was your what, what was your reaction, I guess, as somebody who'd already made this decision to his decision this week? 
Well, you know, Dwayne's nothing if not a bit of an independent spirit, and I, I say that, you know, in the you know, in a complimentary way, I guess. Um, and so he, I don't know that Dwayne, he certainly didn't need my inspiration to make that decision, I'm sure. I would say that the, the reason I did it the way I did it, Rob, and that is I made my decision and my announcement prior to the first delegate being elected to the state convention. It was because I thought that was the way to do it with the most integrity. And, and given my position as an elected official in this party, a former state party chairman and activist for, you know, 25 years or, or longer, I just felt like I owed it at least to the to the party leadership and to the delegates and to the grassroots Republicans to tell them right up front that this was my intention so that they wouldn't for for one thing there might be people that won't go to the to the convention if I'm not a candidate and and I also just wanted to be honest and upfront with everybody and I'm you know me well enough Rob to know I'm nothing if not transparent and so I chose to do it the way I did it for those reasons and I you know why, why Dwayne did it the way he did it is, is uh, certainly, you know, only Dwayne knows for sure. What do you think sets you aside? And, and like you said, there's six candidates in total. Uh, mm-hmm. You have five opponents, really, for, for the nomination. Right. Uh, you know, some of them, I would imagine, probably won't go beyond the convention. But, you know, they all have that, that same opportunity you have to go all the way to the primary. So, really, you've got five opponents at this point. What sets you apart from those opponents as, as a better pick, in your mind, uh, for the U.S. House? Well, first of all, Rob, on the practical side, the, let's just be practical about it politically. I believe I'm the most electable. And I believe that because I've been, I am elected. I, I'm not only elected, but I've been elected twice. And both of the elections that I've won, my last two elections to the Public Service Commission have been with over 60% of the vote. In fact, well over 60%. I've, I haven't had an opponent even get to 35% in the last two elections. So, I, you know, as a practical matter, there's that issue. But, but with that, of course, I think comes the experience level, the, the depth and the breadth of experience, not just in politics or not even just in elected office, but in the office that I currently hold, we deal every day with major issues that I think have set me up in, in terms of skill set and experience perfectly for the, for what America needs in the United States Congress right now. And that is somebody who has a clear understanding of free market principles, of of the the consequence of regulatory overreach, because I'm dealing with it every day, the regulatory overreach of the federal government, and I've exercised my own regulatory restraint in a state that has demonstrated that when you do that, when you trust the natural order of things, that is to say, free markets, you know, supply side um, markets, if you trust the relationship between citizens and and corporations, and, and let those things work. It works very well, and it works to the benefit not only of the individual but of society. And uh, and I think in in today's America, where we are, uh, you know, God knows a terrible place um, economically. We are we have a national security challenges that that um, North Dakota's example and my being right in the heart of it, and especially in energy development is one that, that proves that we can be energy secure, that we can have national security, that we can have economic security and and protect our environment, and cultural resources, and the welfare of our citizens. And I, I think it's a message and an experience that sets me, frankly, a long ways apart from the others. But beyond that, even, there are the philosophical differences. And while you'll hear all of us say similar things about um, the Constitution and liberty, um, you know, I, one of the things I'm very proud of is were my years in the Schaefer administration. I headed up the tourism department for four years as the tourism director and then I served as the director of economic development and finance. And Rob, in those years, we oil wasn't $100 a barrel and we didn't have the kind of largesse coming into the, to the public coffers that we have today. And every, uh, every two years, the budget guidelines would come out from Governor Schaefer, and I would submit a budget that was lower than the one that I was living with at the time. And through that process, we proved that you you don't you can be prosperous, that you can create a foundation, that government can run just fine with less money. And we actually cut budgets, and I cut every budget that I had. In fact, there were uh, I think it was eight fewer FTEs at the Economic Development Office when I left office than there were when I took office. Uh, in the second Schaefer term. And so I think that experience of, of making those decisions, those tough calls, and, and frankly, they weren't all that tough, but cutting budgets and, uh, and making government leaner and more responsive to citizens is something that our country is crying out for right now, and, and I can bring that. You just said a moment ago that you 
one of one of your your most um, I guess appealing aspects setting you apart from the other candidates was that you're the most electable. Uh, your critics might say that you've run for federal office before and you lost. How would you respond to that? Sure. Well, a couple of ways. First of all, I ran in two elections against a long-standing, well-entrenched, and well-funded incumbent in the 90s in, in Democrat election years. In fact, the second time I ran, I, was, I didn't even seek the uh, nomination, but rather was uh, drafted at the convention and reluctantly accepted the party's nomination because they needed me. They, they called on me to do it. They'd been good to me in the in, previous to that. I, I believe in the values and principles of the Republican Party, and I answered that call faithfully. And I, and I have no regret about doing it, Rob. Well, now, you know, it, it's no accident that today there are six candidates running for the seat because it's an open seat. And I think there's some, sometimes there's some uh, illusion, if you will, that because it's an open seat, it's easy, that running for, you know, Congress is easy. And, and a, a lot of people who, who have aspired to that position for a long time but have never run for it, all of a sudden are running for it. And I think the fact that I was willing to do it and eager to do it when it wasn't easy is is not should not be viewed as a negative, but rather ought to be viewed as as a noble and and a good characteristic. Because frankly, Rob, this is tough business. You know, I'm about to subject myself and my family to probably a couple of million dollars from liberal interest groups from Washington D.C.'s attempt to um, to demonize me. I've been through that. And so I think those two elections that I lost in the 90s to Congressman Earl Pomeroy, combined with the two elections that I've won in the last decade with over 60 percent, actually make me a better candidate than the others. And it's an experience none of the rest of them have. Contrast yourself and, and you know, assuming obviously you, you've yet to win the, uh, the nomination and you still need to go through that process. Sure. But, uh, you know, contrast yourself, you know, as, as though you, you had won the nomination with the, the Democrat nominee, Pam Gullison. What makes you a better pick than her? Well, first of all, let's start with philosophy. I mean, I, I, one of the things that I've already noticed in uh, Representative Gullison's approach to this, this race is that she's offered no solutions to what ails America, but she's offered lots of criticism to those who would offer up a solution rather than, than a, a um, intellectual discussion about it or perhaps a suggestion of improvements, for example, and I'm talking now specifically of the, of the Ryan plan. Um, she uses entire columns of newspaper ink to do nothing but, but throw bombs and criticize it. That's where I'm very different than, than Pam because I, I like to analyze situations, I like to think them through, I like to debate them, and I like to come up with solutions and bring people together and try to come up with, uh, while I think consensus is overrated, at least a majority, to, uh, to move the ball forward. And uh, so, so there, there's, there's the philosophy of limited government, which is what I is, you know, um, believe and, and aspire to, versus her philosophy of just um, government overreach, uh, of more taxation, of class warfare, um, of, of sort of pitting classes against each other in terms of, of uh, whether it's entitlement programs or whether it's spending on uh, government programs for, um, for various industries, whatever it might be. I think, it's, I think philosophy matters. I think it matters a great deal. But, but just as I contrast my, uh, myself with my five Republican opponents, I think similarly with, with her is the issue of experience, the depth and breadth of experience in government, in cutting budgets, not growing budgets, in, in restraining regulation, not in enhancing regulation. And, uh, and so I, I don't think there's any question that the contrast with her will be easy for me to draw, and I suspect she'll be doing a, uh, her best to, to, to draw her own distinctions. But, Rob, I really think, and I read her piece on, on the Ryan plan, I think it, it demonstrates why Byron Dorgan, Ken Conrad, and Earl Pomeroy are now looking at their careers in the rearview mirror, and why they, that they as a party have lost just about everything and are probably on the brink of losing it all in North Dakota. The, the sand underneath their feet has shifted. North Dakota has changed. We are not the entitlement state that they think that we are. We are a prosperous state that, that understands the value of, of, of freedom and have exercised it, I think, with, uh, with great prudence. And, and, uh, and they missed that when it was happening. And now I hear her talking and I see her writing, and she looks very much like the Democrats of the 80s and 90s. And I've got news for them. The millennium changed, and, uh, and they've failed to change with it. 
let's talk a little bit about one one of the one of the chief I, I think criticisms maybe c- coming from the conservative side, frankly, of Representative sure. Rick Burke, who who currently holds the office that that you're running for, is that he voted for the debt deal. Uh, that that sure. was something that and and I I make I'm making no judgment of it here, but would you have sure. would you have voted for that if you'd been in Congress at the time that debt deal? Uh, well, I think first of all, Rob, I think honesty requires us to say it looks like a really lousy deal looking backwards. <laughs> so it's, right. You know, With, say, and, and, let's, and let's be clear about um, that. We're looking at this yeah. from 2020 hindsight. Right. But having said that, it's hard for me to imagine myself voting for raising the debt ceiling and getting so little, well, really nothing in return. And that, that's the thing that bothered me. But you know what's funny to me, Rob, about that whole debt ceiling vote? The thing that's most specifically offensive to me and was at the time wasn't even that that the extra trillion plus that they gave the president to, to raise it even later without a vote of Congress, although that was plenty offensive, but, it, but and, and nor the lack of cuts or the crazy, that crazy uh, super committee, which was probably the second most offensive thing, the abdicating of your authority to that. that that's the, but it's just the idea of it all, the idea that we have so little regard for our for the next generation that we're going to borrow and, and continue this status quo spending without any real there's there was really just no no trade off there were no cuts involved in it but but really the, this abdicating the authority or the not the authority the responsibility of elected members of congress to a super committee i i found most offensive and i i wouldn't do that not not only because i find it philosophically um I think uh, inappropriate, but I wouldn't have done it because I don't want to give up that authority. I only get one vote out of 435. I'm not going to give it away to a, to some other people that I barely know. The uh, the the Ryan budget is something, and, and we talked about um, Pam Gullison, uh, your would be Democrat opponent, uh, has has been critical of, of the Paul Ryan budget, specifically some of the reforms it makes to Medicare. Uh, the Paul mm-hmm. Ryan, but it's it's out now. And, you know, would that be something that you would be supportive of if you were in Congress now? Well, it would it'd be something that I would at least um, look at. And, and, I, and, and I want to say right up front, I, would, I applaud him for putting, putting something on the table. Nobody else has. It's not, it's not like anybody else with any responsibility here has. The Senate certainly hasn't offered up a budget and as we know, nearly, what, 1,100 days. And so at least he's offering up a solution. And, and to just sit and throw bombs at it without even, frankly, reading it. I mean, her response to it was out before anybody could have read it. So, you know, she was just reiterating some talking points from the Democrat National Committee. But is this, would I vote for it today as it is? Probably not. But I would certainly like it as a blueprint to start with. Um, things like the Medicare reform that you spoke of, I mean, he, he came a long ways from his first plan, right? I mean, he, he, you know, if, he, in fact, he's doing what the president said Obamacare did, and that is he's providing choices. And he's providing those choices. He's, he's drawn a line at the age of 55. Everybody above that line gets Medicare as they know it today. Not a thing changes. People below that line will have an option. They can either take Medicare as they know it today or they can shop around for, for something else, find the lowest cost. He's, he's implementing some market reforms rather than rather than rationing health care to find the, the, the cuts. Let's remember, one of the things that Pam and, and the other Democrats are most critical of is that it's going to you know, cut Medicare, and, and that's bad for seniors. Well, it was Barack Obama who cut $500 billion out of Medicare in, the, in Obamacare, and then he's going to find those cost savings by rationing health care, removing individual liberty, removing uh, the freedom of the relationship between the doctor and the patient. So... Really, I don't know what there is to criticize in terms of its concept. Now, personally, Rob, I think that both politically and perhaps practically speaking, and I, those two are often the same, you know, maybe the line should be 50. Maybe it should be 45. Maybe it should be 60. I, I don't know. I, I, I can't imagine the line being higher. But, but let's have a discussion about it because we've got to do something to get this country going again to deal with this debt issue and to simply stick your head in the sand and pretend that business as usual is going to take care of everything is is ignorant at best and it's uh, irresponsible at worst. Last question. I know you're a busy guy. Obamacare currently being debated before the Supreme Court. Any predictions on, on what will come out of that? I, I know it's it's notoriously hard to guess what our federal courts are going to do, but do you have a prediction or, or what do you hope happens? I hardly dare be too optimistic about it, Rob. Call me, uh, you know, superstitious, but I know there's a lot of enthusiasm about the questions of, of uh, 
of Kennedy, of, of Justice Kennedy, and, and certainly is asking the right questions, going down the right train of thought with regard to the relationship between the federal government and the individual and how that changes everything. Um, I, I just, uh, boy, would I love it if they would if they would overturn it, you know, in June so that we didn't have to deal with it in Congress because it's going to be a very heavy lift to repeal it otherwise. So I don't have any predictions, but I'm hopeful. All right, Kevin, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Always my pleasure, Rob. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.